All right, Cattle of the Sun God, the last episode of Homer's The Odyssey in part one. We'll read part two later, but uh, this is the last episode of part one. We're coming off of Scylla and Charybdis, the sea monster and the whirlpool. They have come through not totally unscathed. Uh, Scylla ate some of Odysseus's men again, um, but now we are moving past them. Here we go, the Cattle of the Sun God. In the small hours of the third watch, when stars that shone out in the first dusk of evening had gone down to their setting, a giant wind blew from heaven, and clouds driven by Zeus shrouded land and sea in a night of storm. Again, another storm that they have to weather uh, on their trip. They're trying to get home to Ithaca. They're not there yet. So just as dawn with fingertips of rose touched the windy world, we dragged our ship to cover in a grotto, a sea cave, where nymphs had chairs of rock and sanded floors. I mustered all the crew and said, old shipmates, our stores are in the ship's hold, food and drink. The cattle here are not for our provision or we pay dearly for it. So Odysseus is telling his men, we have food on the ship. Don't touch the cattle on this island. Uh, he knows the prophecy that Tiresias had told him. He said, avoid those kine, avoid those cattle, um, or Helios will make you pay. So this is still Odysseus talking. Fierce the god is who cherishes these heifers and these sheep, Helios, and no man avoids his eye. To this, my fighters nodded, yes, but now we had a month of onshore gales blowing day in, day out, south winds or south by east. As long as bread and good red wine remained to keep the men up and appease their craving, they would not touch the cattle. But in the end, when all the barley in the ship was gone, hunger drove them to scour the wild shore with angling hooks for fishes and sea fowl, whatever fell into their hands, and lean days wore their bellies thin. Okay, so they've been there for a month and these people are starting to get hungry and they see a food source in these cattle and, and sheep, but they know they're not allowed to touch them. Got to think of desperate men will go to desperate ends to get what they need. The storms continued. So one day I withdrew to the interior to pray the gods in solitude for hope that one might show me some way of salvation. Slipping away, I struck across the island to a sheltered spot out of the driving gale. I washed my hands there and made supplication to the gods who own Olympus, all the gods. But they, for answer, only closed my eyes under slow drops of sleep. All right, so Odysseus is saying, I went to pray to the gods, but all they did was make me sleep. Right? One day I withdrew to the interior to pray the gods in solitude. I just want to be alone. So he goes off on his own just to go pray. He makes supplication. So that's just when you ask somebody humbly for something. And he's talking to the gods. He just wants to figure a way out. He wants some help. But the gods only closed my eyes under slow drops of sleep. Now on the shore, Eurylochus, who's one of Odysseus's men, made his insidious plea. Comrades, he said, you've gone through everything. Listen to what I say. All deaths are hateful to us, mortal wretches. But famine is the most pitiful, the worst end that a man can come to. Will you fight it? Come, we'll cut out the noblest of these cattle for sacrifice to the gods who own the sky. And once at home, in the old country of Ithaca, if ever that day comes, we'll build a costly temple and adorn it with every beauty for the Lord of Noon. But if he flares up over his heifers lost, wishing our ship destroyed, and if the gods make cause with him, why, then I say, better open your lungs to a big sea once for all than waste to skin and bones on a lonely island. So Eurylochus is doing something a little shady here, right? He's going... Whoops. He's going um, over Odysseus's head. Odysseus has already told them not to touch the cattle, but Odysseus isn't there. And he's saying to everyone, guys, come on, we can't just starve to death. Famine is the most pitiful death of all. So it's better to die at sea at the hands of gods, right? He's saying, well, even if the gods are mad and they destroy our ship, it's better than starving here on this island. At least we'll be a little bit closer to home and maybe we can beat them. Let's see if the men listen to him. Thus Eurylochus, and they murmured, I, 
All right, so the crew's agreeing with him. They're all gonna kind of undermine Odysseus. Trooping away at once to round up heifers. Now that day tranquil cattle with broad brows were grazing near, and soon the men drew up around their chosen beasts in ceremony. They plucked the leaves that shone on a tall oak, having no barley meal, to strew the victims, performed the prayers and ritual, ritual, knifed the kine and flayed each carcass, cutting thigh bones free to wrap in double folds of fat. These offerings with strips of meat were laid upon the fire. Then, as they had no wine, they made libation with clear spring water, broiling the entrails first, and when the bones were burnt and tripes shared, they spitted the carved meat. Okay, so he's telling us about a sacrifice. They're at least making a sacrifice to the gods before they just have a feast. Back to Odysseus. Just then my slumber left me in a rush. My eyes opened and I went down the seaward path. No sooner had I caught sight of our black hull than savory odors of burnt fat eddied around me. Grief took hold of me, and I cried aloud, Oh, Father Zeus and gods in bliss forever, you made me sleep away this day of mischief. Oh, cruel drowsing in the evil hour. Here they sat, and a great work they contrived. Lampicia, in her long gown, meanwhile, had borne swift word to the overlord of noon. They have killed your kind. And the Lord Helios burst into angry speech amid the immortals. All right, so Odysseus right here, you see his little quote marks from here to here is what he's saying. And he's like, oh man, why did you make me fall asleep? Look what happened. Look what they happened. A great work they contrived. They devised this plan and now we're all in trouble. He's saying Lampicia, one of the other nymphs, had borne swift word to the overlord of noon, Helios. So now Helios, Helios knows that they've killed his cattle. So this is what he says, right? The Lord Helios burst into angry speech amid the immortals. Oh, Father Zeus and gods in bliss forever, punish Odysseus's men. So overweening, now they have killed my peaceful kind, my joy at morning when I climbed the sky of stars, and evening when I bore westward from heaven. <clears throat> Restitution or penalty they shall pay, and pay in full, or I go down forever to light the dead men in the underworld. Then Zeus, who drives the storm cloud, made reply, Peace, Helios, shine on among the gods, shine over mortals in the fields of grain. Let me throw down one white hot bolt and make splinters of their ship in the wine dark sea. So Helios is pretty upset and he wants to go crazy and make them pay in full. And Zeus, whoops, and Zeus is just like, come on, Helios, peace, Sh you keep shining, I'll handle it. Let me throw down one white hot bolt and I'll destroy their ship. So now we're back to Odysseus. That little dash there is like a little interruption. We're going back to Odysseus talking. Calypso later told me of this exchange <clears throat> as she declared that Hermes had told her. Well, when I reached the sea cave and the ship, I faced each man and had it out. But where could any remedy be found? There was none. The silken beeves of Helios were dead. The gods, moreover, made queer signs appear. Cowhides began to crawl, and beef, both raw and roasted, load like kine upon the spits. So the meat itself is kind of mooing, like a cattle kind of moos, even though it's cut up and being cooked. Now six full days, my gallant crew could feast upon the prime beef they had marked for slaughter from Helios's herd. And Zeus, the son of Cronus, added one fine morning, right? So everything's going great. They got six days of feasting, the sun is shining. All the gales had ceased, blown out, and with an offshore breeze, we launched again, stepping the mast and sail to make for the open sea. Astern of us, the island coastline faded, and no land showed anywhere but only sea and heaven, when Zeus Cronian piled a thunderhead above the ship while gloom spread on the ocean. We held our course, but briefly. Then the squall struck whining from the west with gale force breaking both four stays, and the mast came toppling aft along the ship's length. So the running rigging showered into the bilge. So Zeus is destroying them. 
On the after deck, the mast had hit the steersman a slant blow, bashing the skull in, knocking him overside as the brave soul fled the body like a diver. With crack on crack of thunder, Zeus let fly a bolt against the ship, a direct hit, so that she bucked in reeking fumes of sulfur, and all the men were flung into the sea. They came up round the wreck, bobbing a while like petrels on the waves. Petrels are these seabirds. I circled the word like to point out that this is a little simile. He's talking about the men that have been flung into the sea are like these dark seabirds that just kind of bob on the top of the water. No more seafaring homeward for these. No sweet day of return. The god had turned his face from them. I clambered fore and aft my hulk until a comber split her keel from ribs and big, the big timber floated free. The mast too broke away. A backstay floated dangling from it, stout rawhide rope, and I used this for lashing mast and keel together. These I straddled riding the frightful storm. So Odysseus has just described how he made kind of a raft out of the wreckage. Zeus has totally shattered their ship, but he's finding these pieces of wood and these, these ropes, and he's kind of making a makeshift raft so he can survive. <clears throat> Nor had I yet seen the worst of it. For now the west wind dropped and a southeast gale came on, one more twist of the knife, taking me north again straight for Charybdis, all that night I drifted, and in the sunrise, sure enough, I lay off Scylla Mountain and Charybdis Deep. There, as the whirlpool drank the tide, a billow tossed me, and I sprang for the great fig tree, catching on like a bat under a bough. So now he's hanging from a tree. The, the sea has shot him up out of the water, and there's a, some sort of tree hanging off the side of a cliff, and he, this is like a cartoon character right now, and he is hanging off of this tree. It makes me think of um, in The Lion King when there's that big stampede and little Simba is like hanging off of that tree when all those whatever they are, wildebeest, are, are trampling past. Think of this. This is Odysseus hanging from a tree trying to survive. Nowhere had I to stand, no way of climbing, the root and bowl being far below and far above my head, the branches and their leaves, massed, overshadowing Charybdis pool. But I clung grimly, thinking my mast and keel would come back to the surface when she spouted. And ah, how long with what desire I waited, till at the twilight hour when one who hears and judges pleas in the marketplace all day between contentious men goes home to supper, the long poles at last reared from the sea. Now I let go with hands and feet, plunging straight into the foam beside the timbers, pulled astride and rode hard with my hands to pass by Scylla. <clears throat> Never could I have passed her had not the father of gods and men this time kept me from her eyes. Once through the strait, nine days I drifted in the open sea before I made shore, buoyed up by the gods, upon Ogea Isle. The dangerous nymph Calypso lives and sings there in her beauty, and she received me and loved me. But why tell the same tale that I told last night in hall to you and your lady? Those adventures made a long evening, and I do not hold with tiresome repetition of a story. The End so see what just happened? Well, first of all, Odysseus tells that at not, he was nine days at sea by himself and then Calypso kind of rescued him. He, he came down from the tree, found some of the timbers that had, had been floating in the ocean, somehow makes it to Calypso's cave. We know from the beginning that she loved him and held him kind of like hostage. And then this last little bit is when we kind of have a break and Odysseus goes back to addressing Alcinous. When he says, you and your lady, he's talking to Alcinous, remember the guy who's going to give him the ship? And he's saying, yeah, I'm, I'm, done telling you your, I'm done telling you my story. And now we have to wonder, will he get a ship back home to Ithaca? Was this story enough for Alcinous to be like, okay, here's your ship. You can go home. So we're done with part one. All of those episodes make up part one. Remember, it was told <clears throat> not in live time. The whole time we've been reading, Odysseus has just been sitting with Alcinous telling him the story. But this is all the things that have happened to him since the Trojan War has ended on his journey just trying to get home to Ithaca. <laughs>